Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode we begin with the Orpheus 2 spacecraft now in Lunar SOI. There's the moon and we are approaching. We've already got a plot to match orbits with the station and so our plan is to transfer this crew to the station and then get the station crew that's currently there out into lunar orbit, have them stay in orbit for it looks like 20 hours and then bring them back home in the hope that that will fulfill this contract. So let's get to it. I'm gonna start time warping and we will get to this node. So we are in the middle of the Apollo 11 anniversary. I'm not planning anything in particular for YouTube, though I'll try and get more realism overhaul stuff and moon related stuff done. Uh, so we'll be, uh, we'll be doing a lot of moon stuff in realism overhaul. Maybe I'll get a few extra episodes done during this week. Uh, otherwise, my main activity is on Twitch, where I am currently... I just started yesterday circumnavigating the globe in an SR-71. We flew from Edwards Air Force Base to Ellington Field, which is in Houston, which is where the astronauts uh, fly their T-38s out of. And while flying around the world in an SR-71, I am reading Carrying the Fire by Michael Collins to my Twitch audience. So that's sort of how I'm celebrating. I really like the book. It's very well written. And it's also good because, you know, people can't always uh, listen in for the whole time. But it's got so many anecdotes that even if you miss a part, uh, you can pick up listening pretty well. Because uh, he just moves on to other things. It's not like if you miss something, you've totally lost the thread. That's a good thing about biographies, of course. Anyway, here we go. For those who might not know, Michael Collins, of course, was the command module pilot during Apollo 11. And so he stayed in orbit around the moon while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin went to the surface. So in the EDB space program activities, which I'll also be doing, doing on Twitch this week, we are aiming to land a Kerbal on the moon for the first time during the Apollo 11 anniversary. That's another thing that we're doing. Uh, of course, previously we had only landed a probe on the moon, so it's going to be quite an effort. We haven't even done uh, certain basic. Th we we haven't even unlocked docking ports yet, so we're basically doing the Gemini and Apollo missions in an attempt to uh, as quickly as possible during this week. So that should be fun. So basically, what I'll be doing is I'll be doing the EDB space program stuff, and then moving on into X plane which is a flight simulator for the SR-71 and the reading of Michael Collins' book. Okay, now looking for a good closest approach distance as our relative inclination gets below one degree. Okay, 1.9 kilometers. That should be fine. It's the moon. It should be easy to make a rendezvous right. Well, not as easy as Kerbin's moon, but still. Okay, I'll keep it to 4 meters per second. We're approaching. Closest approach distance says 100 meters. It's probably closer. Um, generally, more than 200 meters away, that's a little bit uh, inaccurate. Okay, well, I need to make sure I know where I'm docking here. So, at Moonport 1, I suppose we want to dock here at this Apollo docking system. Sort of inconvenient for those solar arrays, but of course the Orpheus 2 itself has solar arrays, so even if those are blocked, the Orpheus 2's solar arrays can help with recharging the station. Okay, and then we've got uh, the little lander pod and the resupply vessel. And that's how it works. We could dock the Orpheus 2 over here, this is also an Apollo docking system, but I feel that, that would be a tight fit with that over there. Best to keep them in line. Okay, closing in on the station now. Not exactly lined up, but looking good otherwise. Okay, we'll just have to coast at this point. Says it's not quite pointed at the target, but it sure looks pointed at it to me. We've got magnetism. Sort of. Kind of. 
Well, I mean, there's no real magnetism in this realism overall stuff, but there we go. There's just a pretense of magnetism. But all right, it's all connected up. Which means that, okay, so that crew is the one that's new. This crew is the one that's old. And we've got Crystalian, Wilnerd, and Bob who are going to leave the station now and proceed back home. Let's see, how much fuel do they have? Okay, seems like it should be enough. Not as much as the incoming vehicle though. The incoming vehicle had an easier time of it apparently. Is there any... well, no, we only reserve deorbit fuel there. No need to carry too much spare supplies, but I think that's, that's just what we need. Okay. Yep, no other issues. So let's see if it's possible to have this crew fulfill that contract or whether it's not going to... it might not count it as a launch a new vessel though. Well anyway, let's just bring them back. How much life support do we have? Right now with seven crew on board we've got 160 days. Once we move them off they'll be back to closer to 300. Spaceport 2 is fine. There's only two crew there. We might want to rotate them off though. Hmm, yeah, we're going to have to fulfill this with a special vehicle. Fortunately, we're building another one of uh, these Orpheus 2 vehicles. That's going to be done in seven days. So we can do that, and we have to do it, um, well, in 227 days, so plenty of time. And we'll be fulfilling the successful reentry contract with this anyway. That probably doesn't pay very much, but it's something. Okay, anyway, bringing the crew back. 994 meters per second here, so it's pretty tight. So we're looking like this. We actually, we go around like that. So probably from around here, we add the maneuver, exit out. But the inclination does cause a little bit of a complication. Not as bad as if it was from polar orbit. That, that can be a little bit trickier to get back home from, at least if you want to aim straight for a low periapsis. But from here it looks like we'll have no problems going straight for the low periapsis. And that disappeared right there. There we go. Well, that's 85 kilometers, but during the actual burn we'll manage it properly. And it looks like we have 200 meters per second of margin. We'll have more on the other vehicle, which came in with more fuel. Oh, wait, uh, it's con it started a timer. Okay, maybe we can fulfill this contract now. Okay, uh, well, cancel this uh, plot. And verify tech life support. Yeah, we've got 17 days, no problems there. And electric charge is holding out just fine. Okay. Good. Good. That's a pleasant surprise. Good thing we checked. Considered it a new vessel for... by some magic. Some luck. I also want to target the station just in case. I want to make sure that we never get close to it. We shouldn't. We uh, increased our orbital period, so it would take a very long time for us to re-encounter the station, but we are still pretty close. Okay, that should do it. Indeed, it uh, has the orbit check marked, so all we have to do is land or splash down on Earth. So, our orbit probably proceeded just a little bit. Somewhere close to here, we can do the maneuver to get back home. Okay, uh, trivial periapsis there. We will want to have a low periapsis. I keep uh, overestimating the periapsis that we actually need. Again, we have plenty of food, water, and oxygen. We've got uh, locked 
RCS fuel in the capsule just in case we need to do those kinds of maneuvers you know those kinds you know flipping back and forth in order to adjust our apoapsis and periapsis but hopefully we won't have to I'll aim for 50 kilometer periapsis ignition all right heading on our way back home still watching close approach distance now we're burning this way looks like uh, we're getting closer to the station really want to make sure that doesn't get too close still getting closer this isn't good um, well I guess it's a good thing I have that up there to check jeez um, two minutes if we get within three kilometers I'm gonna stop this burn well it looks like we'll be flying right past Moonport 1 at a reasonable distance five kilometers okay there it goes safely closer to the surface than we are and getting rid of that we want to check our actual periapsis and that's 50 kilometers hopefully enough hopefully safe we'll find out uh, yep Chris Lean, Wilnerd and Bob are depending on it we should have used the CO2 scrubber there's no reason to have it full up there's plenty of lithium hydroxide in here unfortunately in my experience once the CO2 is full up the CO2 scrubber doesn't seem to work anymore okay here we go Ooh, not that fast and we'll let go of the service module at about 400 to 500 kilometers still with a periapsis of 50 kilometers all right that's good enough service module separation well let's try that again okay and we will expect to hear it explode at the appropriate time I'm not gonna reorient the capsule just yet no need to use its RCS until we're ready but this time a crew rotation from a lunar station I would like Smart ASS to hold roll more than anything else. We'll turn off pitch soon after we get into the atmosphere proper. We are over the Pacific, South Pacific. Plenty of water to splash down in. We have that mysterious floating box thing again. Still don't understand how that actually happens. I don't think I could replicate it in any way. <laughs> I mean, uh, actually deliberately cause that to happen. I have no idea. Okay, no longer holding pitch. Turn that, okay, there we go. We hear the service module explosions. Well, it got uh, exploded in a hurry, didn't it? Okay. Intense forces at work. Ablator is ablating at a prodigious speed. Our periapsis is going up thanks to the lift of this thing. Hopefully not up enough to cause us to go around, but we'll have to see. Oh, that's a lot. I mean, we started off at 50 kilometer periapsis. I uh, brought it up to almost 60. It might be no good. Wait, the periapsis is going down again, but it's too late. We've already passed it. Maybe it'll work out. 
I'm looking at the orbital period in particular. We want that below an hour and 30 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, really. It's not going down fast enough. Yeah. So, it'll have to be lower than that. We all, we let, use less than half of our blader, so it's not, like, dangerous or anything. And again, our supply situation is fine, five days worth. RCS is fine. We used about a tenth of it, maybe, um, maybe an eighth of it. Okay, well, that's 50, and we know that works pretty well. All right, we'll leave it spinning around and around for now, and head on to periapsis. Where it is probably no longer quite as bright, maybe? Let's see, will we get sun? It's still going to be over to South Pacific, but... I think we're over Australia right now. Okay, we're in the atmosphere. Hints of daylight on the horizon, but not quite there yet. Okay, at 100 kilometers here. I'll just, uh, well, take off the pitch and re-execute that. Descent mode has been all on the whole time. Probably complicated our whole attempt to adjust our periapsis at apoapsis, but not a big deal. Okay, looking good so far. Alright, and we will be going down this time. We're temporarily going up, but definitely not going to exit the atmosphere. G-forces are moderate at this point, but this is not where we get most of our G-forces from. So we'll see how they go at that point. We do have Dawn. We are over to South Pacific again. Quite far south from Hawaii. So hopefully the fleet has been dispatched to the right location. Not the most convenient place. All right, going back down again. Here we will pick up what G-forces we will encounter. The heat is mostly dissipated, and we still have half of our ablator, so that's good. That's good for future Mars missions, <laughs> which will have more heating. All right, here we go with the G-force buildup. Well, we seem to have used some ablator on this portion as well. Not a whole lot, but we're definitely below the 50% threshold. 2.4 Gs now. Looks like it's going to peak out at 2.45 Gs, which is pretty good. Now let me just F3 for a sec. I mean, it says most Gs endured 4, but I don't know when it's counting that. I suppose it, uh, since it, it's only counting to five days, right? I suppose that must have been earlier. Okay, letting go of the forward heat shield now. And actually, let's turn descent mode off first. Okay. And arming the parachutes. Full parachute deployment, and as we've seen before, it doesn't bring it to too low a velocity, 9 meters per second. I, I was pretty sure that they probably would have had redundancy, so that if they lost a chute, they'd be alright, but... Maybe that involves uh, splashing down at 12 meters per second or something. Okay, let's not risk anything, recover quickly. Okay, tiny bit of science earned, uh, some funds recovered, and most importantly, our crew gained experience. Four experience points for each member of the crew, Chris Lee and Wilnerd and Bob, 
So, excellent work there, and a trivial amount of reputation. But, did we fulfill our contracts? Um, for some reason, successful re-entry was not fulfilled. So I guess we'll need a different, different vehicle for that. Otherwise, uh, human orbital was satisfied, so all good there. I suppose the next thing we really need to do is focus on that Jupiter mission. Uh, we are building an extra Orpheus. We'll use that as a backup like rescue vehicle or something for now. We'll have that in reserve. We've got a lot of stuff in reserve, as you can see. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, some of that we're going to launch. The Ganymede Lander is what we're going to launch on the Jupiter transfer window. And then the MCV transfer and the Mars class vessel is what we're going to try and launch on that Mars window. And yeah, Moon Trucker is our rover for the moon. That uh, we're not in any rush for. Of course, in the next 62 days, I could do something else with the moon. But probably we'll need the moon trucker for that. Um, I guess we have some time to try and... Well, that takes a long time to build, huh? Yeah, I don't think we're going... Well, that's in the second build slot. Let's see once it gets to the first build slot. It's an expensive thing. I'm not too sure it's the best idea ever. But there's no practical way of, like, uh, making sure we weigh the the USI colonization parts properly. The caribou stuff, it's not like they have real equivalents. So, I guess better to go expensive with them than cheap uh, for realistic sake, realism's sake. Uh, maybe I'll turn it down later after we've built a few. But anyway, no, uh, we'll definitely be doing the Jupiter thing first. Um, looks like even if we put this in the first slot and that in the second slot, that one's going to be built first. Uh, we've got uh, 280 science. Let me just quickly take a look at the R&D. Well, all the science is getting a little bit expensive now. Um, advanced exploration, though. I don't see anything... I mean, we've got some interesting non-RP0 parts that I've added from Wild Blue Industries that I intend to use, but uh, that's going to be... Well, I mean, maybe we should send some of those to the moon. Heck, they're mostly inflatables, so it'll be an inflatable hab on the moon kind of thing. That's uh, not impossible. Here we have a lot of radiators. Precision engineering. Oh, yeah, what we wanted really was ISRU stuff, right? I'm sure everybody's going, well, you're doing stuff on the moon. What about ISRU? Well, where does that come in with uh, real ISRU? We've got an algae farm, but that's not RP0. Ion propulsion, uh, advanced sign tech. Ah, uh, Fisher Tropsk. Uh, processor, yes, this looks like a real ISRU thing. Hydrogen and carbon monoxide input. Mm, ammonia and oxygen input. What exactly are we drilling for, though? I don't see that this drill will give us any of those things. I don't know if there's a special drill, but clearly we have drills here. <laughs> That's the important thing. I can mess with what they convert uh, to and from, but this is where we have the ISRU stuff, it looks like. Um, you have a surface scanner there. It says all resources, so that's really helpful. And this is... Uh, KSP Interstellar stuff starting out. That's just a science lab and all. These are highly advanced technologies. Okay. Well, then I guess we need to have advanced exploration so we can we can eventually unlock those. It looks like we'll need precision engineering as well to unlock this science tech. But let's just get started on this. Oh, it's already being researched. Okay. Well, that's fine. How about uh, science tech then? Not enough science to read. Oh, right. 
Hmm, so we need 20 more signs. Are we already researching this one? No, we aren't. Okay, well, we'll, we'll unlock precision engineering so that hopefully we'll eventually get that science tech. wonder when we get wheels. We haven't invented the wheel yet. I mean, if we take a look at our ability to build rovers, I mentioned this earlier, but I don't think people got the point. We really don't have a good selection of wheels. So yeah, as far as wheels go, we've got these landing gear, of course. Uh, but just scrolling down, lots of stuff in utility. Of course, this is 1.1.3 and they haven't rearranged stuff so that the wheels will be in the landing portion or the surface portion. That's it. Not even the stock wheels. Oh, this the this is the Wild Blue Industry stuff. We'll have to unlock them. They don't cost too much. Maybe we should unlock them and take a look. I don't know about a wagon. What looks like uh, well, that's a command cab, crew cabin. Okay, well we seem to have a sixteen thousand. This seems to be a rover sort of thing. Requires a lot of electric charge. I mean that one requires one point nine kilowatts. Buffalo chassis. So it's just a sort of rover thing. But it's got little solar panels on top of this. Oh, this one, deployable solar panel, 645 watts. That's not enough to supply this, though. Hmm. Extend ladders. But I don't see how to extend the... The extendables, deployable solar panel. Then it's got a little port here. Buffalo adapter. There's various chassis uh, segments. This obviously should be done in the SPH, not here. I don't know if we've unlocked any of the inflatables, but it does have wheels. There's these um, 7,200 to unlock Mountain Goat non-RP0 wheels. I don't feel any problem with unlocking those. Um, obviously not placed right right now, but those will be handy. We could make a different kind of rover with that. This rover, 4,600, it's not cheap, but it's not expensive. I, we haven't finished building it yet. It'll be more expensive. We'll need the wheels, for instance, and those are 750 per set. Um, but still, you know, tough to say exactly what they ought to be priced at. So maybe we should consider this as an option instead of the other rover. I'll take a look at the relative pricing and mass. Uh, right now, I mean, uh, Tag Light Sport automatically puts food, water, and oxygen here. So we'll probably need a little bit more of that, though. Right now, there's 1.8 tons. It's not the heavy, uh, well, I mean, it's not heavy, but a rover probably shouldn't be too heavy. Two crew capacity, so less than the other rover that we're already building. Yeah, we haven't unlocked the inflatable modules, though. I think. There's this Pathfinder one. Oh, this might have inflatable modules. Hold on. Doesn't require much by way of electric charge and generates a lot. Active. Oh, it has a fuel cell, that's why. But it's got. I've got to fix this. It's got a liquid fuel oxidizer fuel cell. Yes, I am uh, putting myself in charge of uh, adapting this for realism overhaul. So this is one of the inflatable modules. How much does it cost? 500. Might want to up the price of that. And liquid fuel oxidizer needs to be removed. And it doesn't really give me the option of inflating it in here, which is not great. Though we can see from the from the nodes where it's going to expand out to. Anyway, so those are parts that I will look forward to using in the future, but not right now. All right, so we'll just go for the Jupiter transfer window and use the Ganymede lander, launch that. But uh, in addition to what Kerbal Alarm Clock had, I added an alarm from Kerbal Transfer Window or uh, Transfer Window Planner, and that's 12 days after that. So we could probably ditch this one and aim for that, since Transfer Window Planner is generally more accurate about this sort of thing. Okay, so here we are with the Ganymede lander on 
a very big Nico rocket. And let's just take a look inside. Make sure I've got the right payload. Uh, I think so. I saw a big dish there. All right, um, throttle up, SAS on, and we've got a four degree relative inclination to the moon, so that's fine. Okay, loud sound coming up, ignition. Up it goes. So this is the backup Ganymede lander. We've already sent one, but I wanted to send a backup one because the contract is quite lucrative. And yeah, it's just better to have a couple of them on the way. Of course, if the first one fails for some, you know, design reason, then this one would probably fail too. But it could fail for an operational reason, meaning that I messed up something or another. Or maybe, you know, um, the particular time that we arrived costed more Delta V than I expected or something like that. Okay, everything looks nominal so far. Lots of engines running. I don't see any difference between the whoop, core engine and the booster engines as far as fuel consumption right now. Wonder if I was supposed to throttle down or something at some point. Oh, we've lost one engine on something or another. That's uh. Okay, where is it? It's there. Okay. Let's have that up. But I'm still worried that the fuel seems to be consuming from the core engines. Where are the core engines? Up there almost the same rate as the boosters. I guess there is some difference anyway. It's not much. Okay, shut off and separation. Very good. You can see the booster that had the problem, obviously not flipping out as much as the others because it's still heavy. And this only has a few seconds left. I don't know if that was how I intended it to be though. Seems a bit wrong. Okay, separation. And ignition. Something bad just happened. Oh, we had that... I probably made a mistake in the placement of things again. Okay, well, uh, four NK-15Vs are ignited, but we won't have control until we are below 150 tons, apparently. I do seem to place that uh, control core optimistically. We've got little verniers for some reason. Oh, because we can relight these, I guess. Hmm. But without avionics, is that a good idea? But actually, I should have waited to light the verniers. Oh well, anyway, we're gonna continue on in this direction for a little while. I guess we'll just use up the fuel. Might mess us up a little bit, might be alright. Probably not too bad. Alright. Uh, fairing set. 
Okay, dumping that stage and hopefully regaining control. Yep. And we're okay. So let's plot for Jupiter. Okay, we're going to go with this burn for now. It doesn't look like this stage is going to have quite enough delta V to get us all the way through it. And that's probably because of the weirdness of our orbit. As you can see, if, come on, come on, come on. Lots of stuff going on here. But yeah, we, we ended up uh, having this sort of orbit after the burn of the upper stage. And obviously that burn point is not ideal. It's quite high up. And it's not at our periapsis. It's closer to our apoapsis. So yeah, uh, not optimal. And that's why we're coming up a little bit short on this stage. Though it's possible that the RCS could probably finish it off. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, of course, it's not like this stage could be used for anything after this burn, so no huge problem. I don't think it was uh, coming into play in any of our plans for, like, later in the mission for a mid-course adjustment, but it is necessary to get this burn fairly correct, so let's make sure of that. Throttle up, and... We proceed. Alright, we are now on escape and uh, we hit the midpoint of the burn right at the node, so we should be good on timing at least. So everything is going nominally and the J2 is doing well. Okay, we're getting close to the end of what the J2 can do. And then it'll be left to the RCS thrusters to do 71 meters per second. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. Then again, they're not really consuming that much fuel right now. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, I guess they can provide 70 meters per second. Let's take a look at what it's actually doing for our orbit at Jupiter. All right, the plucky little RCS thrusters are definitely getting us there. Um, I suppose we could continue physical time warping a little bit. Yep, we don't need any more. So, throttle down. And I hope they didn't take any from, like, up here somehow. I mean, it's all should be locked, but let me just double check. That's locked. It's locked. Locked. It's a tank here that's locked. Yeah, should be all right. They have. A, uh, I put a lot of RCS fuel on that J2 stage. Probably more than necessary, considering it delivered 71 meters per second, or so, and it hasn't actually been exhausted yet. But we're going to have to let go of it now. Okay, so drop. Okay, and power-wise, we are balanced, barely, but we don't have any solar panels, so it's going to stay balanced for the duration. Of course, while we time warp, this will go into low power mode anyway, so that'll be good. We have just enough avionics. Uh, the Surveyor core provides one ton, and then we've got two of the Delta avionics cores, which don't take up much power, thankfully. But let me do a plot a mid-course adjustment to flatten our orbit with respect to Ganymede, or at least try to. And then we should be all set. Um, we've only unlocked... Oh, come on. Yeah, it's going to take a while these days. Um, we've only unlocked that bit. Well, we can unlock this bit too. And that gives us 4,700. Then we still have a stage here, and then the fuel inside the surveyor core to land. So that is the plan is that that should be enough. All right, so the mid-course adjustment is only 17.7 meters per second, and I'll take our orbit from that to a nice uh, orbit that looks flat with respect to Ganymede, and that should be good. So let us make sure that we have that maneuver as a timer. Okay, 260 days, and we're all set. So, another potential Ganymede lander on its way. If the first Ganymede lander works, 
then this one will be diverted to somewhere else. Uh, Callisto would be a good place, but we'll have to see, and uh, we'll just focus on getting science in that case. But you never know, we might need to actually use it to do the main mission. We'll hope that the first attempt works. Anyway, with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.